This video is going to show you how you can include traffic signal automation in a custom electronics project based around the ATmega 328P microcontroller, which is the same integrator circuit as the Arduino Uno uses, and a Raspberry Pi single board computer. This is the final, for now, iteration of my Model Railway Custom PCB design project, which I've been covering for a while. This is a new printed circuit board which adds additional features, including support for more LEDs and adding I2C communication with the Raspberry Pi. I've already covered all the technology involved in this, so I'm going to show the overall project design, how things fit together, some things that I've done differently, and some examples of how it can be used, including in a model railway signal automation controlled by a Raspberry Pi. Before I get into the details, I'll just add that whilst I refer to this as a new PCB, it was actually designed before the one I used in my previous videos. This is the PCB that I intended to make, but I've designed it to be smaller and with more features and flexibility. Due to the number of components and small size of the board, it took me a long time to create the PCB, repositioning components and trying to keep the number of fires as few as possible. To have used this board in my earlier videos would have made them too long, but by designing both boards and having them made together saved on shipping which is the majority of the cost of custom PCBs. I'll also compare what I've created here with some other microcontrollers, whether I'd be better off just buying an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi Pico instead. Here is a quick look at what it's designed to do. It's currently controlling three sets of car traffic lights and a train line side signal light. The car traffic lights are controlled purely by this PCB, but the line side signal light is triggered based on communications with the Raspberry Pi. You can probably tell that these are out of scale, but that's because this is intended for my outdoor G-scale railway, but I'm currently testing indoors with a section of double O track. Later in the video, I'll show the line side traffic signal on my outdoor railway. The traffic signals, as I say, are purely controlled by the AT Mega microcontroller, which is on the PCB. The line side signal is controlled by the Raspberry Pi, which sends an instruction using I squared C. In this demonstration, it's just based on a timer running on the Raspberry Pi, but this will be controlled by detecting an approaching train. So let's get started by looking at the PCB and some of the features that I've added since the earlier videos. This is my earlier PCB. It's based around an 18 mega 328p microcontroller. Effectively, it's an Arduino, but without some of the power and USB UART circuitry. In the center is the microcontroller, with the crystal and some capacitors to clean up the power and clock signals. To the left is the incoming power, which needs to be connected to a regulated power supply, and some pins for connecting to an external UART so that you can program in the chip, instead of the using the USB connection that is used on the Arduino. At the top is an SMD resistor and LED to show when the power is connected to the board. These are optional if you're not ready for SMD soldering, although it's surprisingly easier than you may think. See my previous video. Then to the right are some outputs from the GPIO ports of the microcontroller, which go through some resistors and to the LEDs. This circuit was useful for testing the concept, but it only supported three of the eight millimeter LEDs, essentially one traffic light. And there's no way to communicate with any other devices, except by using the UART pins, which were used for programming. The new PCB is based around the same circuit but adds a few more connections. It's also designed to be fairly flexible, so it's possible to use it for different LED configurations, as well as being able to operate standalone or by communicating with a Raspberry Pi. For communications with the Raspberry Pi, it now includes pins for an I2C connection to the left of the board, along with two positions for pull-up resistors. I'll talk about these resistors later, as you may or may not want to include them. There are then 12 GPIO outputs from the microcontroller, each of which has its own resistor. These then connect to a 24-way connector, with 12 of the pins grounded. And this can be used to connect to the LEDs. The number of ground pins on the connector is more than is needed, but I'll explain my design decisions later. We can start by looking at the most important part, which are the outputs to the LEDs. These go from the digital GPIO pins on the microcontroller to these resistors listed R1 to R12 which then go to the output connector. For most of the components on the PCB, I've included their value, which makes it easier when soldering components by hand. I've deliberately not done so for these resistors, as it gives the flexibility to change the resistors depending upon your design. 
For instance, to get the same level of brightness across the LEDs, I used 220 ohm values for the red and amber LEDs, but then 330 ohm for the green LEDs. The design of the PCB does not limit which colour LED can be connected to which pin. You can choose an appropriate sequence of LEDs depending upon where in your layout you want to install the PCB. For example, line side signals can have two, three, four or even more LEDs. Or you may want to use some for three colour car traffic lights. You may also want to use some for completely different lights, perhaps a red flicker of a campfire or to turn street lights on and off. For this board, which is designed for evaluation purposes rather than for the actual layout, I've chosen resistors for two three colour car traffic lights and then three two colour line side signal lights. Although for the purpose of this video I've actually connected them differently, but will likely use different LEDs when I put it onto my layout anyway. You could even use these for inputs, in which case you may need to replace the resistor with a short piece of wire, effectively a resistor of nearly zero ohms. The output from the resistors go to pin headers. These are designed in two rows so that the left hand pins go to the anode of the LEDs and the right pins go to the cathodes. Using a crimp tool I can crimp female connectors onto the wires of the LEDs and then push them on and off the pins. In reality, where I'm connecting to three colour traffic light set, then the LEDs share a common cathode, so I don't really need all the ground pins, but they do provide the flexibility that is useful during testing. Another thing is that using pin headers means that there needs to be a lot of clearance above the PCB for the connectors. This isn't a problem if you're able to hide the PCB, such as under the baseboard, as you might on an indoor railway, or in a nearby building. But if you're looking to put these into an enclosure, then you may prefer to solder the wires directly to the PCB instead of using the pin header. The other thing I've added is an I2C connector and pull-up resistors. These are used to connect to another I2C devices, which could be another one of these boards if you want to keep them in sync, or to connect to a Raspberry Pi. Warning though, this board is designed for 5 volt operations, so if you're connecting to a 3.3 volt device, such as a Raspberry Pi, then you'll need to ensure you don't send 5 volts on the bus. I've already created a video on I2C, or I2C if you prefer, which explains how this works and how to use it. As I mentioned earlier, the most important thing is to ensure you don't provide a voltage that could damage other components. I2C works by using pull-up resistors, which connect to the supply voltage. If you connect a 5 volt pull-up to this bus, then you can permanently damage a 3.3 volt device. One option is to not install the pull-up resistors on this board, and instead just use pull-up resistors at the 3.3 volt end. As long as you choose appropriate resistors and don't have too much voltage drop before it gets to this board, then it's likely to work, but it could be a problem if you inadvertently connect a 5 volt device without realising it has its own built in pull up resistors. You do need to make sure there are some pull up resistors at some point in the circuit. As with the LED connectors, then if you want to save space, you can solder the I2C bus connections directly to the board. Alternatively, you could use a right angled connector, but then you would need space on the side of the board for the wires to go. If you're connecting to a Raspberry Pi or similar, then I recommend you play it safe and use a voltage level converter, which will ensure you don't damage your 3.3 volt devices, even if you do have pull-up resistors. I'll be covering some different configurations later in this video. The other thing for I2C is that every device needs a unique address. The I2C address is set in the code that runs on the microcontroller, so it's easy enough to change that so you don't get a conflict. The last two connections are the power supply and the UART connection. The power supply uses a screw terminal to make it easy to connect to a power supply, but you could solder directly to those if you prefer. You'll see that there are markings for the positive and negative terminals, which is something I missed on the previous version of the board. Finally, the UART connector is designed for programming the board, but it's not used in normal operation. I suggest using pin headers for those and just connect to an external CP2102 USB UART when you want to upload new code. An alternative is that you could upload your code directly to the ATmega328P on a different device before inserting it into the IC holder on the PCB. Having the UART connector is more convenient if you want to change the code in future. You'll also notice that I've included mounting holes, but these are not lined up or symmetrical. Ideally, I would have liked to place these in the four corners of the board, as I did on the earlier version, 
My priority was to get the board as small as possible to be able to hide it on my outdoor railway. So instead, I just put them wherever I could find space. I'll talk about these during the possible improvements later. For this example, I've connected it up to the Raspberry Pi using an I2C and to the various LEDs. The traffic light LEDs are being controlled in sequence, the same way as previously, but the Raspberry Pi can now send a signal to the PCB when it wants the signal light to change. I've created a very simple protocol which is shown here. This uses the first byte of data as an instruction and the second byte is the LED to communicate with. I've included a command for querying the pin as well. This is not included in the code yet, but could be used if you wanted to connect a sensor instead of an LED, perhaps a read switch to detect the presence of a train. Most of the source code for the Arduino is taken from the previous source code used for the traffic lights and for my I2C demonstration program. I'll just show the code used for the I2C part. You can of course download the full source code from my website. See the description for more details. This starts with the same code that I used in an earlier video, but then it's the way it handles the data it receives. It looks at the first byte to determine what the operation is requested, and the second byte is past the appropriate function. So if the first byte is hex 1, then that's used to call the set signal red function. The second byte is sent as an argument. It then sets the appropriate values in the response array. The request event will then return the values that have been stored in the response. This is a selection of the code from the Raspberry Pi, which is written in Python. The code in the demonstration just loops around turn in the LED on and off, but when used on the railway it is integrated into the existing source code which controls the train. The trigger sent from the Raspberry Pi can be controlled by a sensor and a timer. In my layout I will be using it for when the train is able to leave the station. The light will turn green to allow the train to start, then after a time delay to allow the train to go past the signal, it will change to red. Here are some of the different ways that the board could be used. The primary controller could be either a Raspberry Pi or this custom Arduino circuit. The controller would send messages to the different devices, which are the peripherals. This could include different devices, such as the Raspberry Pi Pico or a standard Arduino. Please be aware if your devices use different voltages and ensure that you don't send a 5 volt signal to a device that can only handle 3.3 volts. There are alternative microcontrollers that could be used, or you can use a full computer such as a Raspberry Pi. The main reason for choosing a custom board is because I wanted the ability to make this myself. Electronics is something I enjoy and I like to be able to create a custom PCB that can be used. An alternative would be just to use a normal Arduino. The custom board is slightly smaller than an Arduino, but a bit bigger than the Arduino Maker series. The custom PCB does however include the current limiting resistors for the LEDs, which would otherwise need to be go on a shield or be placed elsewhere before going to the LEDs. Another alternative, which wasn't available when I started designing this, is a Raspberry Pi Pico. I've already created another video showing that in use, although without the I2C feature. With the Pico, then you need to include the current limiting resistors, but it is a little smaller. There are also some tiny microcontroller boards, such as the Tiny 2040 and the Espressif boards designed around the ESP32 series chips, which also include wireless capability. These other boards don't necessarily have as many GPIO pins, but can be used as an alternative, perhaps on a remote part of a layout where only a few connections are needed. Or well, this PCB can be used in any kind of combination with a variety of different devices. I'm very happy with this board, but there are some things that could be improved. For example, now that I've shown that SMD soldering can be quite straightforward, all the resistors could be replaced with SMD versions, which would reduce the size of the board quite considerably. By reducing the space, this would also provide an opportunity to reposition the mounting holes to make it a bit more symmetrical. The real limitation in terms of size is the size of the ATmega 328P. This is also available as a surface mount component, which would be an alternative and use less space. I'm also interested in the possibility of getting a bare RP2040 chip, which is used in the Raspberry Pi Pico. They're not available to buy individually at the moment, but I believe that's the plan for the future, and that would allow us to make a much smaller PCB, potentially with even more functionality. So that's this project finished for a while. I've mainly been testing on an indoor railway for now, 
but I'll be integrating this into my outdoor railway as the weather improves and I hope to revisit it then. I'm currently using reed switches to detect the presence of the train, but I'm also looking at infrared proximity detection as an alternative. You can find out more details including links to the relevant files on my website www.penguintutor.com. This includes the keycad files for the PCB, the free CAD files for the signals and traffic lights, and the source code for the AT Mega and the Raspberry Pi. I will still be creating other projects and I've got some ideas already based around the Raspberry Pi Arduino and Raspberry Pi Pico. So if you haven't already subscribed, please do so and click the bell notification icon so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. If you've liked this, please give it a thumbs up or leave me a comment if there's anything else you'd like me to cover in future. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you on a future video.